Hello to you all. Hello, guys. We shall continue with our lecture in engineering metallurgy, lecture note two. I am Dr. B. Dan Asebi. Um, this is the course outline, um, foundry technology, foundry practice, and lastly, we're going to look at engineering materials. These are the reference materials used in producing this lecture note. Um, we start with foundry technology. Foundry technology basically is foundry practices and foundry technique. Um, we start with what, uh, what is a foundry? A foundry is a factory equipped for making mold, smelting of uh, metal, performing casting operation, meaning pouring of this uh, molten metal into mold to become solidified, and finally performing cleaning operation. Um, workers who are involved in um, casting operations or activities in um, this foundry or in the foundry, the activities um, carried out in the foundry are called foundry men. Economic smelting of um, cast iron, steel, aluminium, and other non-ferrous alloys or other ferrous and non-ferrous alloys are carried out in a foundry or are some of the activities carried out in a foundry. Um, foundry practice, um, in all casting operation, the metal has to be heated to molten state and then poured into a mold to become solidified. So this is done using furnaces, and we have um, about five com uh, typical um, furnaces used in foundry. So let's look at each after the order. Um, first, we start with cupola furnace. Um, it's actually a vertical cylindrical furnace equipped with a uh, tapping spout at the base. And this is um, predominantly used for casting um, cast iron. It's usually um, popularly used for um, cast iron. And um, other furnaces can be used, but this is popular and provides the largest tonnage of cast iron. So let's look at um, the cupola furnace, cupola furnace. This is a schematic diagram of the cupola furnace. Um, you can see the steel casing for insulation. There's a refractory, refractory lining in there. You can see the tapping um, spout at the bottom. You can see the blower. And then the ingredients are poured in here. The ingredients, um, the foundry uh, man or men will climb up uh, onto this um, charging floor where the ingredients are going to be poured into the cupola furnace. The ingredients are called charge. And they involved um, four major components, um, the iron, coke, flux, and for the, uh, other alloying elements that will enhance the property. As I said earlier, this is popular for um, casting of um, um, cast iron, for producing cast iron. And also the fourth um, component um, uh, is the fourth or fifth, because here we have um, four components, is the, four, the, the combustion product. Here it's the uh, combustion medium, which is first air. Hot blowing air is going to be um, pumped in here, blown in here for the combustion. And then um, after the, the melting, we uh, tap the iron at the bottom and also slag uh, impurity. So let's look at the, um, the charge um, materials. Basically, there are four, as I said, though with inclusion of alloying elements could become five. And first is the pig iron. The pig iron here is um, a semi-finished product from the blast furnace, from blast furnace, and then um, scrap steel. These are unused um, iron and steel that have been um, uh, left for a very long period of time. They can also be added to increase the yield. Next is coke. This is gotten from coal, and basically it is carbon used for reduction of the oxidized um, iron to iron to get the um, uh, pure do we don't have we can we cannot get 100% uh, pure iron we could get up to 99 point uh, 99 point above uh, purity of the iron almost 99.5 or even 99.8 but we, it's, it's not um, it's almost impossible to get pure iron do pure iron itself is not really um, uh, useful for engineering um, uh, application because it's ductile, so we need it in alloyed form. The third um, uh, ingredient is um, the flux. It's calcium carbonate, 
and basically what we require here is the calcium oxide by heating limestone to get calcium oxide this is added so that um, we can remove impurity in form of slag so the calcium oxide reacts with um, the impurity in the impure ion and then it will become as it melts and it becomes slag and so the slag uh, can be separated from the ion here is the hot air used for the combustion so seven tons of raw materials are required to produce one ton of iron and in these um, four components this is the order two tons of iron ore including the scrap iron and steel and then one ton of coke one ton of coke uh, half um, ton of limestone the flux and then three and a half tons of gas is the hot air used for the combustion here as it melts the iron we have um, iron and um, uh, the iron and then the purified iron and then the slag which are immiscible they are, uh, the, it means the, uh, the slag is not soluble in the iron and so it can be se uh, it can be separated the iron tapped uh, here and then the slag can also be tapped from here above because the density of the slag is a bit is lighter than the density of the iron next uh, the next um, uh, furnace is direct fired fuel di direct fuel fired furnace this is schematic diagram here it also has a casing uh, with refractory lining on in the casing for insulation these are the charged materials being put in the in the furnace we are tapping spout here it's a direct fired f uh, f um, furnace because there is direct uh, contact uh, with the the fuel um, uh, the the burning material burning fuel and the charge ingredients also the previous one the cupola is also a direct fire because there is a direct contact here there is um there is a burner and the the fuel use is usually natural gas and then this is the bon um, burner that leads up the natural gas for the combustion um there is a reflecting roof here which reflects the the heat onto the charged material to concentrate it for um uh, the the melting of the charge or uh, the charge or the ingredients and this is popular for non-ferrous when we say non-ferrous the not um alloys that don't contain iron um uh, for example copper based alloys and aluminum based alloys well, next is the crucible furnace this is indirect there is no direct contact or there is no direct yeah there's no direct contact with the ch uh, uh, com uh, charge material the ingredients and then the fuel and this is done using the aid of um, um what we call crucible so we have three types of crucible here for this um, type of furnace the lift out the stationary and the tilting we look at one after the other and the lift out here after the melting of the ingredients uh, the copper can be removed and it can be brought out you know and poured into the mold typical fuel here is oil gas and powered um, coal these are some of the popular fuels that can be used for this combustion next is the um, stationary here you need to um, put out you need a you need to uh, a container to ladle out the the molten metal onto the mold so all these three types here of the crucible they are not direct there's no direct contact with the with the burning fuel and the ingredients this is with the aid of a um, crucible and then we have the tilting here when it is um, in molten state it can be tilted there's a tilting handle which can be it can be tilted and then the uh, molten metal poured into the mold this is suitable for melting non-ferrous metal it means metals or alloys that do not contain ions such as bronzes brass um, bronzes brass etc next is the electric arc furnace this is done with the aid of um, electrodes as current passes through the these electrodes an arc is generated and the arc causes the heating in this um, um, furnace heats up the compartment the ingredient um, usually oxygen can oxygen can be born, uh, blown into the furnace and line so uh, that you can remove um, so that you can remove impurities and when you put them here uh, slag and this impurity is formed in a form of a slag 
Um, the slug is usually um, lighter in uh, less dense, and so it's usually at the top, which can be taken out first, and then finally the leftover molten metal can be poured, can be taken out also. And um, this has a large um, flow rate capacity. You can see from 22,000 to 45,000 kg per hour. This is predominantly, uh, pre predominantly or typically used for casting of high quality steel. And then we have the induction furnace. This uses the principle of electromagnetism. Here, as current passes through the, the coil, the copper coil um, magnetic field magnetic flux is generated and so there is an induced current which causes the the heating this is popular in uh, for casting of um, steel so almost um, almost uh, many types of copper or all types of um, sorry all, all this is good for almost all types of metal here in uh, for good for casting iron and steel, copper, aluminum. So here is for ferrous and non-ferrous metal, and even precious metals can be cast using uh, the induction furnace. Let's look at the principle here. Yes, the magnetic flux causes the mixing. Magnetic flux, magnetic flux generation causes the mixing, and then the induced current causes the the heating. This is the principle. Um, based in uh, on this method next after the melting um, what is um, required is the pouring cleaning and other activity um, other activities such as heat treatment usually moving of the molten metal um, into the mold is you uh, is done using a crucible so here um, there are two types of um, 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 uh, mostly it is accomplished by ladles um, the handles so there is a um, large volume and there is also two-man ladder let's look at them here here is a diagram of the large volume and two-man ladder so the large volume here is with the aid of a crane and then we have the two-man ladder here this is the top view and this is the side view so let's look at um, a pictorial view here this is in a foundry. Um, here looks like the large volume using a crane, and then there is a ladle here being by the handle by two men, foundry men here, and this is the mold. The multimeter is being poured into the the mold. These are several molds here. Um, here next is um, ox oxidation prevention of the multimeter. So we ensure that we prevent oxygen um, from getting into the the mold as the multimeter is being poured because it can cause defects so to be, to be able to prevent um oxygen being trapped into the into the cast with first you need filters filters are used to be able to prevent this secondly ladders have been devised so that the uh, the liquid can be poured from the bottom Instead from the uh, instead instead uh, instead of it being poured from the top, so these are some of the two ways you can prevent oxygen. There are other operations. Let's look at them. Um, here we look at the cleaning operation. After the oxidation, next is the cleaning operation. Here is from A to E. I refer to um, I refer to in foundry work as cleaning. So the first we start with the first is trimming operation. This involves removal of the gating system so all this here um, on the line is the gating system and any other excess metal uh, excess metal from the cast so after removing the gating system you also trim out the um, excess metal let's look at what the gating system is now um, the gating system is a pathway through which the molten metal uh, goes into the the mold so this is the uh, mold casing so all these components here are the gating system together with the riser so this is what the what is going to be removed right all this the gating system and the riser 
and then after removing it you'll be left out with the solidified you allow the the solidified uh, the cast to become solid to become solidified then you remove uh, any other excess um, intrusion on the cast if costs are used they have to also be removed for example if you are producing a hollow component such as a pipe uh, the core has to be carefully removed surface cleaning is also very important if it's a ca uh, sand casting if you are involved in using a sand mold so surface cleaning is important you have to clean it properly like filing operation using a file to uh, smoothen the surface uh, if there are defects defect could also be possible in casting so inspection is needed to be able to detect this um, defect heat treatment is also being carried out can also be carried out to enhance the the properties basically here when we say heat treatment we uh, our the intention is to enhance the mechanical property to improve the mechanical properties basically strength and hardness um these are some of the um, defects that could result in casting operation here the first is misrun here it's not completely filling the the mold it is an example of um, a cold shoot here there is a um, uh, premature solidification and so and there is a core uh, resulting in a core within the cast here is called um, cold shots this uh, is as a result as a result of um, splattering where solid globules uh, solid globules can be formed you can see them here um, cold shots solid glo um, globules can be formed here or when there is um, like um, splash and splattering in the pouring um, process here is a shrinkage cavity you can see a cavity here and um, here is micro porosity all through pores are being um, uh, repeated all through here like air entrapment and um, the inspection here inspection is also very vital there is visual inspe inspections to be able to see defects there is also um, dimensional measurements to ensure that the geometry the size is within the required tolerances and there is also a physical mechanical metallurgical test that can be carried out these are some of the tests that can be carried out if uh, it involves um, like uh, a pipe then uh, the final cast is like a pipe then pressure testing is very important um, radiographic methods these are uh, usually non-destructive um, tests that are carried out to determine internal defects there's a physical test such as density and um, water absorption that can also be carried out on the final cast mechanical casting uh, testing also can be carried out such as tensile strength hardness impact and metallurgical tests also can also be carried out um, using optical microscope or SEM scanning electron microscope and chemical tests of corrosion thermal conductivity can also be carried out to determine the the quality of the cast let's look at this non-destructive test magnetic particle testing you can see here if there's an internal crack this can be detected by accumulation of the magnetic particles by the sensor indicating that um, there is a defect in there there is also um, ultrasonic test let's look at um, um, diagram of this ultrasonic testing here you can see a back-to-back -back signal or back-to-surface signal indicating here all is well but when there is a defect the signal is a bit shorter indicating that there is um, there is a flaw there is a defect within the and the and the cast um our last topic is engineering materials here we have basically um, four types of engineering engineering materials we have a uh, metal ceramic polymers and then any com combination of these two or these three is called um, composite it can be composite when you have um, two uh, or more than it you can have a um, hybrid composite so let's also see the types of um, composites that we can have these are the three major and as i said earlier that when you have the two mix mi um, mixture of the two you form composite um, here when you have ceramic and metals you have metal matrix composite 
an example or uh, ceramic um, or metal matrix or ceramic matrix composite whichever way when you have plastic and metals you can have metal filled plastic composite and also when you have plastic and ceramic you can have um, ce um, uh, 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 ceramic uh, matrix or meta uh, plastic uh, matrix um, composite So metal is characterized by ductility, this ab ability of material to be stretched within the uh, plastic region that's uh, after the elastic limit, the metal can be much more stretched. You have also malleability, ability of a metal to be formed, to be forged, you know, to be formed into uh, shape by either cold working. So this is malleability. Luster is the property of material to shine. Um, metals that shine, um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, examples are gold, silver, platinum. They have good luster. They have good shining um, property. Uh, electrical, high electrical and thermal conductivity conducts electricity because the electrons are always in motion, right? In metal, moving within, and also thermal conductivity. So any heat from one point can reach to the other point because the metals are in uh, you know constantly moving so let's look at um ductility you can see here this is a more ductile material as compared with this this is brittle here after the stage of the limit of the hooks law um, the extension for this is a little bit but this extends more so this is more ductile why metals are important? Because they have high stiffness. Um, stiffness here, we are looking at the um, stiffness and strength. And they also have high toughness here. Toughness is a combination of strength and um, ductility. It gives uh, toughness, good electrical conductivity, good thermal conductivity, and cost. The price of um, steel uh, specifically is competitive as compared with other engineering material still is predominantly used is predominantly used in engineering um, application let's look at um, stiffness and strength yes yeah, stiffness can be in terms of the axial tensile it go or it can be in terms of um, the bending of flexural so in either case it is given as this or um, this this E is the extension cross-sectional area. This is the original length. While here, extension uh, um, uh, length and um, I, moment of inertia. And the I here is the moment of inertia. So starting forms of metal, it can be from the cast, that, that is the product from the blast furnace or it can be wrought. This here we are looking at um, a metal that has not been cast, almost a pure metal. We call it wrought metal that has that can be worked or forged. And then we have also powdered metal. The starting point uh, form is um, in powdery form. And this can be uh, then further uh, turned into by to product, it's turned into product by, by what you call sintering, compaction or compacting under high pressure or temperature so these are the basically three types of um, certain forms of metal we also need to understand the difference between um, ferrous and non-ferrous metal ferrous metals means they contain iron or ferrous alloys while non-ferrous are all other metals apart from iron if it is the alloy it means combination of these um, other metals and it is alloy then combination of the iron with other metals so let's look at it this is the classification between ferrous and non-ferrous. The ferrous that contains iron can be steel or cast iron. And then under types of cast iron, we can have these four types, gray, ductile, white, malleable. And then if it is steel, we can have low and high alloy steel. And then it can be broken down here, subgroups. Let's also see the um, different types of um, <coughs> product of um, or alloys of iron here we have the what we call the wrought iron this is almost pure iron high purity iron 
um, the carbon content is less than 0.1 percent we can distinguish them with respect to the carbon content when we have steel it means the carbon content is a bit higher as compared with the rot here and also when we have cast iron it means the carbon content is much higher uh, so when the carbon content is from 1.5 percent higher we call it cast iron and less than that in between the percentage for that of rot and cast we call it steel we also have super alloys these are high performance material these are novel materials from present breakthrough researches and they could be um, iron based it means iron uh, uh, alloyed with these three elements nickel chromium or cobalt it could be nickel based it means nickel alloyed with these three and then it could be cobalt based so these materials they have high perform they are we call them high performance material they can be they have high thermal resistance and also have high strength so they can be used at for at elevated temperature for example in missile in jet engines you know why temperature is high we also look at uh, metals and alloy alloys they are very important because um alloys are so important that when you combine metal together a metal basically we need a what we say what a base metal and any other metal to form an alloy is a mixture of or compound of two or more elements at least one is metallic the advantage of alloy is that it significantly improves the mechanical property much superior than the individual constituents or the individual metals alloys are important because individual metals may not be able to may not be able to satisfy the strength requirement and so when you add alloy them the property becomes superior as even compared with the individual constituent gold silver have good property but we cannot be using gold gold is very expensive even copper though has appreciable strength and when you alloy it with nickel the strength becomes superior so there are two types of um, two main categories of alloy we have the solid solutions and we have the intermediate um, phase so let's look at them the solid solution here solid solutions here is a solid means um, there is a solute and the solvent so it means the solute dissolves in the solvent so when the sol solute dissolves in the solvent you don't see any phase it becomes one single phase because is you can't see any any change since the solute has dissolved in the solvent so if the solute solutions we have two types we have substitutional and interstitial so let's look at them this is substitutional it means they have similar property the atomic radar you can see for example this is a good example of copper and nickel it means copper and nickel can substitute um, each other to form an alloy they have similar electronegativities they have similar valence shell electrons outermost valence shell electrons and they have similar um, atomic radii so um, uh, combining them together to form alloy significantly improve the property as compared with the property of nickel or the, and, or the property of copper here we are looking at in terms of the mechanical property strength and hardness similarly here this is intestinal this is an example of iron and carbon the carbon is the duct is the uh, is uh, is the one colored in black color here the small dots here and so the space in between the carbon atom the iron atoms uh, carbon can comes in and fill these um, spaces and so the iron here is the solvent and the carbon is the solute and so it dissolves and so you can't see any difference in both of these cases it's only single phase you see you won't notice the the two elements because one is soluble in the other and um, secondly with the intermediate phases alloys so here um, because the limit of solubility is exceeded so they now appear as two phases instead of a single um, phase region okay, let's look at them here these are the types here of the two phases we have two solid solutions which is um, an example is okay I'm coming back to it we have metallic compounds here um, when you have a metal and a non-metal like um, here is an iron carbide we have also intermetallics when you have two metals forming a compound magnesium lead here and so and sometimes you could have um, 
the combination of an, um, a metallic compound or intermetallic with a solid solution here alpha so let's look at the two when we have two solid solutions we call it two phase so here this is a um, lead thin phase diagram here we have the alpha here is the solid solution here is meaning that um, the tin within this region is soluble in in the lead in such a way that you can have only have one phase this is a um, solid solution single phase this is another solid solution single phase beta the because here we have high content of tin almost 100 percent so the region here the lead is soluble in the tin and here is an example of the intermediate is in is intermediate between the two extreme of the solid solution so here you have two phase alpha plus beta this is another example of two phase that's uh, sorry an example of intermediate phase this is ion carbide here is an example of um, a metallic compound also this is an example another uh, metallic intermetallic compound here this is the boundary of the intermetallic compound magnesium lead here this is an example of a solid solution alpha plus a metallic compound so this is an example of a solid solution and a solid solution and a metallic compound this is it here alpha plus intermetallic of um, tin as i said earlier the solid solutions are usually found at the extreme ends extreme two ends here is an ex so it's very small you can't see it the solid solution of um, tin here is a solid, solu solid solution of um, copper it means the tin within this region is soluble this is an example of an intermediate um, usually they are all these are intermediates they are in between the two extreme solid solutions thank you for listening to my lecture um, goodbye thank you